Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, today. I'm Kibra, a global marketing specialist at Alvin Technology, and we are delighted, delighted to have you join us. Today, we will delve into the live animal imaging with a specific focus on real-time intravital microscopy and in vivo cellular level imaging in immunology research. Now, let me introduce our presenters. Dr. Pooja Jain is a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Drexel University College of Medicine. She also holds a joint appointment in the De Department of Neurobiology and Anatomy. And today she will present the live uh, intravital imaging of myeloid cell trafficking into the spinal cord of mice. But before that, we will start with um, a brief introduction to novel intravital intro imaging by Dr. Pihan Kim. Dr. Kim is currently the CEO and also CTO of IBM Technology, and he is also an associate professor at Korea Advanced uh, Institute of Science and Technology. Throughout the webinar, please feel free to ask any questions using the Q&A box below, and we will ensure to address as many questions as possible. Dr. Kim, please begin with your presentation if you are ready. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Kiran Kim. And then today, you know, I will try to introduce our technique, our technology of real-time intravital microscopy for in vivo cellular imaging of various internal organs in a live animal. Okay, so as many of you may know that the intravital microscopy is a very useful technique that can provide a direct, detailed live video in single cellular level in a live animal model. So in this example, in the middle, this is the uh, time-lapse video obtained from the lung of a sepsis mouse model, and then in green, it's showing the uh, blood circulation, which is uh, fluorescently labeled by intravenously injected uh, apparatus T3 spectrum. And then in red color, is actually intravascular neutrophil inside this vessel in the lung. These neutrophils are labeled by inject intravenously injecting uh, LI6G antibody conjugate with the red chloro. And then that those you know that uh, antibody conjugate circulate the blood flow and then uh, blood vessels and then label all the neutrophil inside the vessel in red color as you can see in this video. And then in this video, uh, let me move on to the next slides. Okay, so this is how we uh, you know manage the long motion for our intravital imaging. So in in the left side, what you're looking at is the mouse model is prepared for uh, lung imaging. And then in the middle, this is our lung imaging window chamber. So you can see this uh, small suction hole in here so we can suck out the air from the uh, from the, this chamber and then build up the negative air pressure enough to stabilize the motion of this lung against the transparent copper glass like this. And then after this preparation, we can take this 10 minute timeless video from the lung of a sepsis mouse model. And then uh, as you can see, you know, suddenly it's several you know, neutrophil make a cluster and then it completely blocked the arterial here and then disturb the blood flow uh, in this particular area of the lung. So this is what's nearly happening in cellular level uh, in the acute uh, lung injury mouse model of sepsis. Okay, let me move on to another example. So, you know, again, this intravital microscopy is a very useful tool to obtain the several level imaging of live tissue in a live mouse model. So this is the preparation for the imaging of the popliteal lymph node uh, behind the knee, as you can see in the middle in this photo. Uh, and then this is one of the images we obtained in a low magnification. So in this example, what did, this is the, in green color, it's actually vessel. So we labeled the uh, vascular endocellular cell by injecting anti-CD31 antibody that can systemically label all the endocellular cell 
in this mouse model. And then we inject the uh, uh, red color, red fluorescent T cell intravenously through the tail vein. And then this image was obtained at one hour after this T cell injection. And then as you can see this on oh no, a numerous red fluorescent T cell uh, formed to the lymph node, uh, this particular uh, papillary lymph node, but they are mainly still stay in the certain area inside the lymph node. Which is called HB, high intracellular venue. So these arrows you know, point out the high intracellular venue inside the pathogen lymph node. And then as you can see, most of the this T cell is still you know, remain around this high intracellular venue at one hour after the injection. So if I zoom in, so this is the another timeless video obtained from uh, this setting. So in this example, uh, this red kernel is the endocellular cell of the high nasal venue, blue upside. And uh, blue color is the fibroblastic reticular cell, play again, labeled by the antibody conjugate. And the green color in this video, green color is the T cell. So as you can see, the intervention injected T cell arrives here and then attached to the endocellular cell. And then it quickly, you know, tries to migrate through the endocellular cell junction like this within you know, just the five minutes. So this is the first step of the T cell you know, uh, you know, homing to the lymph node. And then if I extend the uh, time period to two hours, now we can see the whole process of a T cell, and in this particular example, T cell and B cell, extra vegetation in the, uh, this HB of the lymph node. So as you can see, you know, this high this, uh, this lymphocytes, T cell and B cell, they actively infiltrate to the lymph node parenchyma through the certain, you know, endocellular cell junction inside this high, uh, in this high endocellular venue. Okay, so, and then that only the uh, cell, we can also image the drug as well, as long as it's after fluorescence labeling. Uh, okay, I'm sorry whether you can see the video here. So this is the real-time video obtained from the liver of the mouse model uh, on this uh, left portal. Uh, and then in this particular example, we use uh, uh, type 2 JFP mouse model. So all the you know, vascular endocellular cell express JFP. So all this green color is the liver sinusoid endocellular cell uh, in the liver. And then we inject the nanoparticle, the red fluorescent nanoparticles through the tail vein. And then, uh, so when this move starts again, okay, this is when we inject the nanoparticle. And then after around 10 seconds, this fluorescently labeled nanoparticle you know, flows through the uh, liver sinusoid vessel. And then they quickly, you know, accumulate to the certain area inside the liver uh, in the liver sinusoid, as you can see in this video. And then we can, you know, easily distinguish the, you know, single flowing nanoparticle inside the vessel. Okay. So now we can extend it actually the time period in in, in a time wise we can extend uh, the our imaging time. So this is another example of the uh, imaging of nanoparticle delivery to the tumor mode, uh, to the cancer model by using this dosage skin pole chamber. So this is two hour six hours and 24 hours after the intravenous injection, intravenous injection of this nanopartic fluorescent nanoparticle through the tail vein again. Uh, and here, the green color is the triple negative breast cancer cell line, MD and B231. This cell line, was in, this cell is implanted inside this uh, uh, dosage skin pole chamber in this border. And then again, the blood vessel, this tumor blood vessel is labeled by the injection of anti-CD31 antibody. And then let me remove it, the green color here. So at two hours, we don't see many nanoparticles inside the tumor vessel. At six hours, now we can see the increase of the nanoparticle, that, but they mostly stay inside the vessel. But finally, in 24 hours, we can see even more increased nanoparticle. And then many of these nanoparticles you know, get out of the, uh, got out of the blood vessel and delivered to the you know, tumor cell. For example, here, here, 
and also here. So, you know, interpreter microscopy is a very useful uh, technique to visualize the delivery of the drug to the target cell in a live mouse model, like this. Okay, so this is the short summary. So interpreter microscopy, they can enable a dynamic 3D imaging of various several level dynamics, as shown in this video, in many different organs. And then, you know, we can see, you know, various several level dynamics, such as cell trafficking, you know, cell to cell interactions like this, or cell to microenvironment interaction inside the live, you know, animal modeling people. And then, as I showed you before in this two example, with the drug development, the intravital microscopy is also, you know, again, a useful technique that can enable a direct imaging analysis of drug delivery to the target tissue and cell. And then also we can monitor the drug efficacy in the target cell after the delivery and then validate the mode of action in a live mouse model in vivo. Okay, so the, our intravital microscopy have been used to image, have been, you know, uh, applied to almost all the internal organ in the mouse model. All, this, all of these images obtained from the uh, live anesthetized mouse, mouse model by using our intravital microscopy setup. So as you can see, we, we have been able to image bone marrow, you know, brain, brain tumor, you know, retina in the eye, skin, you know, hair quality in the skin, various tumor models, you know, pancreas, spleen, GI tracts, adipose tissue, prostate, plus anti pregnant mouse model, memory tissue, well, lymph node, kidney, you know, muscle, heart, lung, and so on. Okay, so let me briefly introduce our uh, dual mode in by the pumper core and two photo microscope model, which is called uh, IBM CMS3. So it's a single box package, the, you know, all in one package system for you know, optimized for in vivo several level imaging of a live animal model. Uh, as the example I showed you before. And then it can do both of two photon imaging with four different color by using a compact pentasecond pulse laser integrated inside this box. And then at the same time, it can also do compact imaging uh, with four different color uh, by using a uh, you know, whole wavelength you know, compact laser module. And then in addition, uh, this box has additional optical ports on the back side to connect, to integrate additional laser systems, such as tunable, more conventional, tunable titanium sapphire pentasecond pulse laser system for two photon imaging. Okay, let me show the uh, short video about the, this microscope. So, so as I told you, you know, this microscope can connect to the uh, other in additional laser system. And then in the front, you can open up our box, and then we have you know animal stage. They can place the animal model for imaging like this. And then you know so you know by using this in a, in a single box packaging, you don't need the you know complete dark room. You don't need a dark room. And then this microscope also can be installed in a very small you know space. And then inside you know we have you know multiple optical components. To do to perform the four color four color imaging, and then also four color uh, two photon imaging as well. We have uh, two photon lasers inside our box, and then you know for two photon, you know we have a four color you know NDD detect NDD two photon detect as well. So we can do you know simultaneous four color imaging for both of compo four and two photon imaging. Oh, sorry. And then, well, as you, many of you already know, the compocal microscope is a very useful technique that can, you know, provide the, you know, section g stack imaging in a six sample, like a live tissue in a live mouse model. And then this is the one representative data obtained from the inguinal adipose tissue of the, again, anesthetized mouse model in vivo. Green color is the adipose site. And red color is all other cell types like the vascular endothelial cell and the macrophages. 
And as you can see, we can have a very high resolution JSTAG image in the live mouse model by using our compact imaging mode. And then later, you know, we can make it as a 3D rendered data using this JSTAG imaging data. Well, two photo microscope is another technique. Uh, it uses longer wavelengths near infrared contest and compulsion laser, so it can penetrate more. And then it can also do process imaging, like the compact imaging, like this. In addition, this two photo microscope can detect SHG signal, the second harmonic generation signal, generate from generated from the collagen and the other you know, regular protein fibers in the mouse model without any labeling, without any additional labeling. So this is a label-free technique, imaging technique. And then since this SHG signal, second harmonic generation signal, is uh, very efficiently generated from the collagen fiber bundle. So it can be a very useful, you know, signal to visualize the fibrosis uh, uh, in a mouse model like this. So this is the uh, one example obtained from the liver fibrosis mouse model. So all this color, all this green color is the fibrous collagen accumulated in the liver of this liver fibrosis mouse model. So, you know, let me show you just another, you know, four color, uh, simultaneous four color, you know, imaging, uh, two photon imaging result obtained from the skin by using our uh, pattern second laser system, laser module inside this microscope. So this is the uh, GSTEC data obtained from the skin. And then green color is GFP, H2B GFP, so from the nuclei. Red color is the Roja 26 uh, membrane PD tomato from the, all other cells. And then this white color is the collagen uh, visualized by the second image signal. So as you can see, we can nicely see the coherence signal from the nuclei and the cell membrane and together with the collagen uh, in the skin. So the, all of, most of these are the dormant collagen in the skin. And then this is again, uh, you know, simultaneous process and second generation imaging uh, from the skeletal muscle. And the blue color is actually blood vessel. Uh, labeled by the uh, intravenous injected uh, advanced group. So, well, we can we can do this poor color imaging almost every organ and tissue in a live mouse model. Like uh, this is data from the pancreas. It's another example obtained from the kidney. So we can nicely distinguish the individual tubule in the kidney by using our two-photon microscope. And then, you know, all this data can be visualized in 3D and also in 4D. So this is 3D data obtained at different time points, and then we can, you know, generate this 4D data set. Okay, and then this microscope, another unique feature of this, you know, two-photon microscope is each equipped is a high-speed laser scanner for real-time imaging. So with the 512 by 512 pixels per frame, we can obtain 30 frames per second at default mode. And, up, and then you can increase the speed up to 100 frames per second, uh, 100 uh, frames per second. Uh, that's options. So by using a rotating polygon meter, I don't want to give you go into too much detail, but by using this uh, unique you know, rotating polygon meter scanner, we can achieve this very high speed. So it enables us to you know, directly monitor the flowing cell in the blood vessel. So this is the example, another example obtained from the, this tumor mouse model. So blue color is the pseudo color uh, tumor cell, and the green color is the red blood cell. We uh, present the red blood cell. We uh, inject, intravenous inject into the, this mouse model. So you can see this flowing IVCs in this tumor mouse model. And then we can directly you know, compare how the uh, blood flow is different in this mouse model. And then this is another real-time uh, real data obtained from the liver. So again, red color is the RBC and green color is the vessel. So we can nicely, again, we can nicely see the flowing RBC in the lung. And then we can also do the same thing, similar thing in the heart as well, by using our uh, tabularized heart imaging chamber. And then, you know, our, you know, very recent work, you know, in press in nature vessel is AI processing model for denoising of this real-time video. So on the left, uh, on the right hand side is the low data, low video in real time. And then by using our new AI processing technique, we can very efficiently 
and then very effectively denoise, uh, uh, remove the noise from this uh, noise in real time video like this. So this is a, another example, the low video and then denoise the image uh, video. And then you can nicely see the displaying in a regular cell in this vessel obtained from the muscle. Uh, another, another example on the, obtained from the kidney. Okay, and then this high speed laser scanner, you know, also enables us for automatic uh, live tissue motion compensation function. So, you know, we can, you know, directly monitor, directly, you know, capture the, all the tissue motion in this mouse model. So, you know, and then while we are doing it, while we are obtaining this live video, we can do frame by frame, you know, image registration to compensate the tissue motion in a live mouse model. Like this. So, you know, you know, this motion compensation function is a very essential, you know, it's indispensable to obtain this high resolution, the high quality motion stabilized the image from the live of tissue, like this. Like I, as I show you in this slide. Another example. So this is actually the video obtained from the, our real time video obtained from the kidney. And then this is, you know, quite, uh, you know, common, you know, movement we can observe from the uh, internal organs. And then again, you, know, you can see the, the, you know, impact of the motion compensation with and without. And then we implemented this uh, function, motion compensation function to be easy to use. So it can be done you know, automatically. So what you need to do is just uh, turn on the automatic compensation functions. And then we can from this real time video, we can automatically generate this motion compensated, the motion compensated high, high external images. And then also inside this box, we you know have taken care of you know body temperature control uh, by using this tablet PC, uh, and it is tablet controller. And then we can also have uh, this heating and then controlling uh, temperature control system to uh, to maintain the temperature inside the box. Okay, so by using this microscope, we have been able to image the uh, you know, many, almost every organs in a live and estimated mouse model. Then if you're interested, please visit our website, www.ivimtech.com. And then it can, it has information what you can do with the different, you know, digital model. And then we also have a, you know, various webinar series focusing on each specific application like uh, peptide imaging or exogen imaging, for example. And then we, pro we also provide the uh, imaging service as well. So if you are interested, you can just send us your material to test, and then we can do the all the you know, implemental imaging experiment for you, and then give you the data, and then you know, provide you the data. Uh, this is one example. So this is the exogen imaging, exogen delivery imaging, 10 minutes and 30 minutes after the injection. So you can see this radical exogen was you know, attached to the, you know, delivered to the surface of the target cell. And then later it internalized at 30 minutes after the injection. Okay, so I've been technology. Uh, we are providing the microscope and then we also provide the imaging service as well. And then with our in-house specialist team with more than 10 years of the experience, we can provide the very specialized you know, application software. And also we can provide the technical and training service as well. So thank you very much for your attention. Very well. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, very All right. Good. So mm -hmm. let me just give you an idea about what we are and how live uh, in neuroimaging has really helped our research, you know, over the years. So my lab is in Philadelphia, Drexel Med, Med mm -hmm. School. And um, mm -hmm. our overall goal is to really actually understand how immune system responds to inflammation and infection in central nervous system. So we use this technology for studying, you know, the problems in brain, various types of the uh, diseases. And also when um, Philem was mentioning exosomes, we are working on exosomes, mm -hmm. although I have not mm -hmm covered that you know so that's another mm -hmm. thing that we would be extremely uh, interested mm -hmm. in and I have several collaborators mm -hmm. in Jefferson Temple and mm -hmm. John Hopkins whom I would be mm -hmm. happy to 
share about this uh, you know newer system that you guys have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. just in a just to give you an idea what we are so for last uh, over two decades my lab has made some uh, seminal contribution and discoveries in the field of uh, uh, neuroinflammation and also virus induced cancers so we have discovered a myeloid cell based target for multiple sclerosis mm -hmm. and other neuroinflammatory diseases and we have done the preclinical validation and mm -hmm. these studies were really when it started from my uh, introduction with IBM technology. We also have discovered a very new and unique reservoir for HIV, uh, which is in AIDS patient undergoing therapy. And this reservoir is by cervical lymph node. So that also was the project that initiated by my interaction with the intravital live my, uh, imaging. Currently, we are working on a very new immunotherapy strategy that involves new antigen discovery and immune checkpoint blockade, and we are applying this in the setting of both cancer and neuroinflammation. Finally, we have discovered a new target uh, called MEF2 against a non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but that is something not necessarily related with IVM. So I'm going to just share highlights from the our uh, neuro project. So why it's important to study the brain-body interactions in health diseases? Because you know, as the uh, healthcare industry is evolving, we have people living very long, healthy life, but with aging comes the chronic diseases. So one of those chronic diseases are diseases of the brain and they could be considered as the 21st century epidemics and these diseases are facilitated by a crosstalk between the brain and our immune system because now we know that our central nervous system including both brain and spinal cord is capable of mounting dynamic immune responses against infection trauma stroke and toxin and collectively we call them ni responses or neuroinflammatory responses which are associated with several diseases such as multiple sclerosis alzheimer parkinson huntington's as well as uh, hiv and other virus associated neurological complication so so uh, this review from uh, Michelle Schwartz from Wiseman Institute really nicely lay out the program for us that how the uh, most of the problem in our uh, in the brain and spinal cord is because of the failure of brain immune crosstalk. So that will be a, a suggested reading for those who are interested. So how this really happened? So the human central nervous system is a highly vascularized unit. If you take all the blood vessel that supplies fuel to our brain, you can make over 100,000 miles of blood vessels. And through this intense network of blood vessel, there are two areas called meninges and perivascular cuff, where blood brain barrier is much thinner, allowing a lot of opportunity for immune cells to interact with the CNS, uh, resident cells and together they make a neurovascular unit. So neurovascular unit is made up of a highly specialized microvascular endothelial cells, which actually make high endothelial venules within the CNS. And then these are lined by the foot pad of astrocytes and parasite and also associated with neurons and astros, uh, astrocytes as well. Through the lumen of these uh, microvascular endothelial cells, a slew of immune cells constantly enter into CNS for immune surveillance. One of those cells called dendritic cells, which are most potent antigen presenting cell, have been the focus of our research. Uh, which was greatly facilitated by uh, the consultating advice and collaboration with late Professor Ralph Steinman, who discovered dendritic cell and received Nobel Prize in 2011. So why are we interested in dendritic cell? Because they are very strategically located in the three areas of antigen encounter. For example, blood-borne pathogens are sampled through spleen, uh, tissue-borne pathogens are sampled through peripheral lymph node, and, and the mucosa-borne antigens are sampled through mesenteric lymph node. Now, dendritic cells are positioned in all three, these three sites armed by the receptors for protein sensing like tall-like receptor, 
or RNA sensing by rig-like or DNA sensing by uh, DNA-like receptor. So what happens that whenever the body encounters any in, uh, uh, insult by inflammation or infection or any other pathogen allergic encounter, these circulating dendritic cell capture the antigen and they roll over for the endothelials to go to nearest lymph node. Inside the lymph node, dendritic cells are able to process and present antigen to naive CD4, CD8 T cell, and those cells become activated and come to periphery where they are primed to deal with the problem that has body has encountered. So pretty much the entire choreography of immune system sets place like that. And this is also the fundamental of vaccine, how the memory response are created. Now, with the two photon imaging, we can very nicely see, so this is also coming from the similar to what film showed, imaging the lymph node of animal for the localization of T cell, T cell area and B cell area and superimposing with the circulating dendritic cell. So as you can see, the macrophages are pretty much on the margin. They are called marginal zone macrophages and dendritic cells are embedded within T cells and B cell area. So T cell moves on chondroids, but B cells move on a very specialized dendritic cell called follicular dendritic cell. So my interaction uh, with the dendritic cell migration is started by my visit to the Theodor Kocher Uni Institute in the University of Bern, Switzerland, where I work with these German scientist Brita Engelhardt and her team. And we together for the first time provided evidence of the dendritic cell migration into the CNS. So the when we were doing it, so we had to go with the conventional method where we obviously start with the area prep like film showed associated with a high sensitivity video camera and then collecting image and processing. Now, when I was interested to see the behavior of dendritic cell in brain, I could use two photon microscopy because two photon microscopy requires the area under view should be very, uh, very, very stable. So this is again film, this image is like 2006 or seven, very early first generation two photon microscope. So what we did is a, we created a meningeal uh, window in the skull of mouse, which is normal. And we injected two uh, quantum dots to expose the meningeal vasculature and then labeled our immune cells, you know, with CFSC and introduced IV. So what we notice that when the CNS is very intact, there are few cell cross blood brain barrier, but when there is no problem in the brain, no inflammation, they come back. So we showed that why people thought that CNS has no immunity because these cells undergo constant surveillance, but they come back in the periphery. Now, what happened in the inflammation? So, you know, for inflammation, the best model is EAE, experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, which is caused by the infiltration of immune cell in CNS. And it's the good model to study multiple sclerosis. So we use two type of uh, EAE model. And then we did um, the our preparation. So this requires two type of preparation. Here, what we did is a microsurgery on the heart and introduce a catheter uh, into the carotid artery. So carotid artery feeds into the CNS directly. And then we expose the spinal cord and put a film and to expose the entire spinal cord. So remember, these animals are uh, not um, naive. They are under high inflammation. They have hind leg paralysis. And second thing is that because we have to image the entire spinal cord, we could not use the two photon uh, microscope because the area under observation is under highly mobile. So this is a video microscopy. So that is something for you guys to look at it for the larger area. How can you really uh, use the two photon? So we use the video microscopy because the the and the the spinal cord you know is under constant uh, uh, mo movement and we cannot like stabilize and we wanted to see the behavior of cells throughout the spinal cord so here we are injecting our dendritic cell through iv in the heart and observing their uh, entry into cns so as you can see because the microvasculature is highly inflamed thousands and thousands of uh, myeloid cells cross the blood brain barrier and they enter into the cns making very firm contact so this 
was the first evidence provided that what happened in the people who are going through constant inflammation, there is a burst of immune cells entry into the CNS. And these cells, like we show in normal animal, do not come back in circulation. They make a very firm contact. Then finally, when animals survived two hours after surgery, so we could find where all the cells went. So we showed that a lot of cells are accumulated into meninges, where I showed you that it's a thinner blood-brain barrier, but we could find cells in parenchymal, perivascular, and intravascular regions. So the cells enter through various regions into the CNS. Then uh, when I came back from Switzerland, I collaborated with a lot of people in the radiation oncology team in John Hopkins, and we showed that this is a near infrared imaging. So in near infrared imaging, you can image the entire, it is still live imaging, but it's non-invasive. So you can image the entire uh, CNS, including brain and spinal cord, and observe the behavior of immune cells trafficking. So here, using the uh, probe label antibody, we are showing that as the degree of inflammation increases, in three different animals, the migration of myeloid cells uh, pattern increases. So by the animal, when it's fully inflamed by score of 3.0, the dendritic cells who, who were limited to the half the length of spinal cord reach up to the brain, and they co-localize with T cells and myelin, myelin basic protein. It means they are able to do in to antigen presentation and setting up this cascade of neuroinflammation. Followed by that, we provided evidence in the 3LL cancer model where we introduce our uh, PSMA label disease in the uh, close to footpad. And then we notice that if the tumor was spread in the brain, the cells over the period of time uh, developed the reach to the area of um, a tumor site. Similarly, using eco MRI, we showed that if you have a, a tumor introduced in one site of rat brain and you put the radio label dendritic cells over the period of time, they move to it. So pretty much by various imaging tool, uh, we were able to provide that that lot of these uh, cascade of neuroinflammation is caused by the crossing of cells to the blood-brain barrier and their constant entry into the CNS. And these studies we able to apply in the inflammation model such as MSEAE in the tumor glioblastoma model and infection HIV and neuro AIDS. You know, now given uh, with respect to the time, I'm not going to go through all the data, but I will just provide you the main um, headlines for uh, the MS. So uh, all our MS related work has been uh, published in Nature Scientific Report, where we showed that a uh, one of the uh, single dose antibody treatment of CLEC 12A can attenuate the disease in animal and provide protected immunity. Now this paper has bo both data from um, in vivo imaging as well as lot of functional studies. Now, followed by our study, the paper in Nature 2015 by Jonathan Kipnis lab actually showed again by the live in vivo imaging that there is a very functional meningeal lymphatic system that runs across the side, across the skull of a mouse, and it has high concentration with the sinus area. And what they showed that there is not just a migration of cells from periphery to CNS, there is a retrograde transport of the cells that enter into the CNS through this meningeal lymphatics and they lead into drain into cervical lymph node. So this is the another, um, you know, another cartoon created to show what happened when the lots of immune cells enter into CNS upon inflammation, they gain access to the rostral migratory system from uh, basal ganglia, and then they tra travel through the newly generated neuroblast. You know, so the neuroblast, uh, which are constantly produced, they come back into the peripheral circulation. So the any immune cell, T cell, dendritic cell, uh, neutrophils that enter, they migrate through these um, uh, uh, these neuroblasts and they uh, uh, find the home in cervical lymph node through nasal mucosal lymphatics. So using this, uh, this information, we actually were able to standardize a very unique reservoir 
for HIV, what we showed, again, all this data is published, I don't have time, what we showed that dendritic cell, when they take HIV virus, they can sample the virus in CNS and they bring the virus back through rostral migratory system and they put all the virus, which actually was in CNS, they protect that virus in the cervical lymph node on follicular uh, dendritic cell. So this was, we showed using 11 different rhesus macaque uh, and the uh, provided the evidence of uh, virus reservoir being in this. Again, all this work is published, feel free to look at it. But the point is that imaging studies could be very functional and they can highlight the, you know, what's really happening. So with that, I wanna just thanks the two various students who over the year contributed to the work and also my collaborator within the United States and across the uh, globe. So with that, I will end and take any question that you guys might have.